All right, um, so we're discussing fracture and the last thing we did was to introduce the brittle fracture criterion which says that as long as the critical stress intensity factor is not reached by the stress intensity factor then we are safe from fracture and fracture here indicates a catastrophic and very rapid propagation of the crack in a structure. Um, now, let us demonstrate the idea immediately with an example, in fact, with our, critical, um, with our classical example to calculate critical values that are associated with loads and dimensions of the crack. So, we are going to take this critical, the, the classical scenario where, again, remember, we assume that if there's a crack of width 2a, half width being a, and the dimensions of the plate, only the in-plane dimension, the 2b matters, the height is very large compared to b, and the thickness is irrelevant, um, and we apply a far field stress s. And we are interested in whether fracture occurs or not. Now, we know, apart from safety factors, that what we have to do is we have to calculate the stress intensity factor, which is equal to s root pi a, um, at this stage at least, and we compare it against k1c, the fracture toughness. And fracture occurs when the equality is satisfied. Okay, so we have two important scenarios that we need to consider. The first scenario is when the crack size is fixed, and for a given crack size, we are interested in the largest force such that fracture does not happen or, alternatively simply, the critical value of the force, let's call it SC, at which fracture occurs. So, for a given value of A, the critical value is such that this equality is satisfied. So, the critical value is equal to K1C divided by this quantity, which is therefore equal to k 1c over root pi a. Okay, so here we are uh, limited by this value of the load. Now the second important question that we also need to answer is suppose we are given a load and we are interested in the largest defect or in this case the crack size that can be um, that can be somehow sustained within the structure and which means therefore that I set I solve for the a such that for a given s this equality is satisfied so that value of a is the critical value ac and leaving a on the left and taking k1c over s I square both sides divide by 1 over pi so the thing that I really need to remember is the fracture criterion. This is what I need to remember by heart. As long as I remember that, I can calculate for a given crack size the critical load or for a given load the critical um, crack size. Now, both of these cases are important um, to consider, uh, but when we look at these two cases, well, the first one is very straightforward. Suppose I give you a certain crack size and I am interested in finding the critical load that can be supported, and suppose I calculated, I suppose it turns out that it's not as high as I want it to be. So if I'm giving given a certain uh, load that the cross section needs to support, if I increase the thickness, for a given load, if the th thickness increases, the far field stress, the average stress is going to decrease and therefore if the value of SC is not as large as I want it to be or uh, eventually um, let's put it the other way, if the load that I want the that I want the cross section to support, if it's not as high as I want it to be, that's a better way to put it, I can increase let's say the thickness such that the given SC can support a larger load because the cross-section area is larger. So, the desired for a given value of A, there is a certain SC and the corresponding load can be adjusted by adjusting the dimensions of the uh, plate. So, in other words, this scenario is avoidable um, by reducing the or adjusting the stresses 
for instance, by thicker cross sections. Okay, so in other words, suppose let's emphasize once again, I give a structure and there is a crack on it, it extends into the structure and I want that structure to carry a certain load, the load is given and the load divided by that cross-sectional area is the given value of S. If that value exceeds SC, I can make this cross-section even thicker to make sure that the error stress is less than SC, such that this crack does not catastrophically propagate. Now, the second scenario is a little bit more sinister. We are giving a, given a certain S, so in other words, the load over area is fixed, and we are finding the largest crack size. Okay, so that's a very practical scenario. I check my existing crack size against this value. If it is less than that value, I am safe. And if it is somehow close to that value, then I start to perhaps really think carefully about what is happening. Now, if it's considerably less than AC, the value of A, it still doesn't mean that I am safe. Suppose AC is one millimeter and my initial crack size is one micrometer. You might think that we are very safe, but it turns out that cracks actually, especially under cyclic loading, in other words, when the value of S, let's say, keeps increasing, say to 10 MPa, decreases back to zero, to 10, to zero. So it's the case when I pull and leave, pull and let go, pull and let go, or it's when you take essentially something like a rod, when you bend it and then unbend it, bend it, unbend it, the stress, the maximum stress is going to go to a certain value, come back to zero, etc. That's a cyclic loading. And under those cases, that initial one micrometer size crack will sinisterly grow and eventually it might reach that value. So um, the fact that the crack size initially is very small doesn't mean that I am safe. That's why I need to know the critical crack size that a structure can sustain so that I carefully monitor the, um, the um, crack size that is existing in a structure this can be done for, say, bridges, or it can be done for, let's say, an airplane, um, and believe me, they do this. Um, so eventually, I'd like to make sure that if I find a crack, that it's not important, or I do something about it. So we'll come back to that point eventually. So structural health monitoring addresses the issue that essentially A less than AC, uh, perhaps initially, Um, but cracks can grow. Okay, so I'd like to know the largest sized uh, crack that the structure can sustain. Now, another issue that is sometimes of importance in the problems of this type is whether we will get a uh, yielding or a uh, fracture first. Now, this is a very simple state of loading, so our failure criterion with respect to yield is simple. If the stress exceeds the yield strength, uh, then there will be yielding. Uh, but we have to carefully check for which stress. Now, in this case, the stress that we're going to check is the average stress on the cross section. There is a certain load. Load divided by the area up here is S. Now, the load divided by the area where the crack is, uh, it's slightly different, uh, the area stress at the cross-section where the crack is present, because the area is reduced by the presence of the crack. But remember, A is much, much less than B, so it turns out, therefore, that the area stress on that cross-section is the same as S. Okay, so simply, therefore, if S is less than um, sigma not the yield strength, uh, then I don't get yielding. If it's equal, that's the onset of yielding. Now, um, therefore, um, let us assume that the crack is of a size A, and I am going to calculate the K1 value for that size, and I keep increasing uh, the value of S for a given A. Now, two things might happen. Either K 
reaches the value of K1C and fracture happens or S reaches the value of sigma naught yielding a cur yet K1 is still less than K1C, the fracture toughness. So in this case, the load has increased up to the yield strength of the material and fracture has not occurred. This is a case where the structure experiences yielding first. All right, now notice that we are using the average stress. The reason we're ever using average stress is we know that the stress concentration factor is infinite in the vicinity of the crack tip. There is going to be a very large stress, um, um, but eventually uh, we are not interested in yielding in regions very close to the tip of the crack. It turns out that that yielding will quickly, uh, due to that yielding in fact, uh, the stress field slightly away from the crack tip will already go below the yield strength and therefore yielding is physically limited to a very very small region in the vicinity of the crack tip. Moreover, assuming despite the fact that we're saying yielding, let's say the, the, the metal that is actually yielding is fairly brittle uh, so that the uh, plasticity effects can be omitted within the process of the crack propagating. In other words, all the energy that is released from the system is almost all of it is going to the into the generation of new crack surfaces. So this is still a brittle fracture scenario, despite the fact that the word yielding comes into uh, play. So uh, brittle fracture is not necessarily limited to perfectly brittle materials. You can have yielding, but it just needs to be uh, limited with respect to the amount of energy that it absorbs. Uh, okay, so uh, now there is a certain quantity which is called the critical crack length. Or um, a better word would be the transition. Okay, and I am going to use the T of transition the transition crack length, and we're going to look at critical values associated with the transition crack length, uh, and let's call that AT, uh, where something special happens, okay? So the value of AT is such that I plug it into the K1 value, so the value of A is at the special value of AT, and I keep increasing S, when S is equal to sigma naught, simultaneously K1 is equal to K1C. In other words, in this particular scenario, yielding and fracture happen simultaneously. Um, now, from the expression that we have just written, we can easily solve for AT, and AT is equal to KIC divided by sigma naught squared 1 over pi. Now, therefore, for a given material property, K1C and sigma naught, okay, uh, I can solve for AT, which almost looks like a material parameter, it almost is, but there are some complications associated with the expression of K1. We will enrich it further, but at this stage, for this type of loading, it does seem like a material parameter. Okay, so as soon as I know the value of AT, then I can make some decisions, um, some decisions um, very um, quickly based on the value of AT. What I know about AT is that the critical value that is necessary, the critical value for this given crack size when A is equal to AT is simultaneously the one that causes yielding. So now let me ask you a, uh, let me ask you two questions. So let's say again A is given, okay, um, and I keep increasing S. Okay. And I'm going to ask you two questions. Um, one, I have a scenario where A 
the crack size that's given is less than the transition crack size. And two, A is larger than the transition crack size. Okay. Now, in one case, yielding will occur first as I increase S to some value beyond zero. And in the other case, as I increase S, fracture will occur before fracture. Again, let me repeat, I have the structure, I have a certain crack size, and either A is less than the transition crack size or it's greater. In one scenario, as I increase S, yielding will occur before fracture. In the other case, fracture will occur before yielding. Okay, so the question is, in which case, which one occurs first? So I'd like you to take a minute and think about it. Okay, now we say that when yielding occurs first, this is a yield limited design. And in this case, if, if, if fracture occurs first simultaneously, um, then, then it's a fracture limited design. Uh, so the answer is the following. Now, when A is less than 80, right, this is the criterion that defines the value of 80. If A is less than 80, so if this value decreases to sustain the equality, the value of stress I need to apply to ensure fracture occurs, that's what equality means, it needs to increase, right? Equality indicates fracture. If A is less than 80, S, which presently here is sigma naught, needs to actually go beyond sigma naught, okay? So as I increase S, when the equality is satisfied, right, before the equality to be satisfied, S needs to be larger than sigma naught. So the value of S will reach sigma naught before it causes fracture, okay? And hence, this case is a yield limited design. So let me summarize when S equals sigma naught, okay, K1 is not large enough to make sure that the equality holds. K1 is smaller than K1C. Okay. And therefore, this is a yield limited design. Now, on the other hand, when A is larger than AT, even when S is less than sigma naught, right, AT, A is larger than AT, this quantity, the value of A that goes here, right, increases. And now before the value of S reaches sigma naught, fracture will occur. So if this increases, then this needs to decrease, right? So as I increase S before it reaches sigma naught, the equality will already be satisfied and therefore fracture will occur, okay? So when S is less than uh, sigma naught, K1 equals K1C, and therefore this is a fracture limited design, okay? And if A is equal to AT, as it is the case here, that's the definition of the transition crack size, they occur simultaneously. Now, finally, notice that for any given value of KI, I can always define a, a, a safety factor on the stress intensity factor, which is equal to the largest value that I can have divided by the actual value that I have. That's the usual definition of the safety factor. You can have safety factors on the crack size and on the load, etc. Uh, but this is the one that typically we are going to use.